Chapter Four of A Yellow Journalist by Miriam Michelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Fascination of Fantan, wherein Miss Massey scents graft in Chinatown. It was nine in the evening when we met at the corner of the alley. Sergeant Wiss of the Chinatown squad, Forbes, the big green reporter who had been sent along to take care of me, and myself. The sergeant was brave in his uniform. Forbes was undisguised, except that the linen he wore at the office no longer redeemed his shabbiness, so that with his soft hat pulled over his brows, his collar turned up, and his coat buttoned over the dark flannel shirt, his big, round-shouldered figure might have passed for a type of the depraved young white who haunts Chinatown, who plays the guide on occasions, but plays fan-tan and peddles lottery tickets oftener. As for me, well, half an hour before, when I left home, the Chinese laundryman was pushing the basket of soiled linen into his dilapidated old black wagon. By the time I had tottered around the corner, balancing unsteadily on my wooden Chinese slippers to where Forbes had a carriage waiting. The laundryman had climbed to his seat and caught the reins from his spare-ribbed old nag's back. Then he saw me, and the quick swinging salutation he chanted out in Chinese made my painted face tingle and my long blackened eyes dance with delight. To him I was a Chinese boy, sure enough, and that was all I wanted just to be able to slip obscurely along with a seesaw motion in my dark blouse and wide trousers, with my cued head under an American hat held low, for a block and a half, from the square where I stopped the carriage, to the alley where McCabe had arranged that the sergeant should wait for us. So it's Fantan tonight. You want to see a Fantan game? What won't you try next, Miss Massey? The sergeant spoke in a bluff, hearty voice, too hearty to suit me, for it was easily audible to the group of Chinamen just across the alley, a group that dissolved and hurried away even as Wiss spoke. Shh, I cautioned, and his voice fell. You want to see if there's gambling in Chinatown, eh? Well, there may be, a little, in spite of all the squad can do. You'll never stamp it all out. Chinamen are crafty devils to deal with particularly the Weong Tong, the Gamblers' Association. We've closed them up pretty tight, but down here on Pacific or farther up the hill, we may catch them, for my men have been kept busy raiding the bigger places. We'll see, anyway. Congratulations on the make-up. It's great. Really? I asked, eagerly looking up at him. A fine big fellow is the sergeant of the Chinatown squad. It's such a comfortable rig if it weren't for the shoes. I put out one of the wooden-soled things to corroborate me. Really, he answered, smiling. Only you don't want to give away the game by looking up like that. No China boy's got any light in his eyes. Keep him down, Miss Massey. Keep him down for the sake of peace. To white men as well as chinks. And demurely I obeyed. There was a flirtatious glint in the sergeant's own eyes and a challenging hint in his voice, but my head was too full of schemes and plans that went deeper than even Wiss suspected to do more than say to myself. It's the subtle influence of the Orient, Rhoda, and the suggestiveness of feminine disguise. Men can't resist either, so the combination must be a hard one for a mere police sergeant to go up against but that hasn't anything to do with the case which concerns Fantan, and the hunch the news has got that there's grafting going on in Chinatown, that every Fantan game pays five dollars into the bribery fund, and of the two thousand dollars raised weekly for this purpose, this same gallus Sergeant Wiss is strongly suspected. Up this way, please, the sergeant interrupted my train of thought. He strolled slowly up the hill. Forbes beside him and I following. It was misery at first, balancing along after them on the narrow, crowded sidewalk, along which the Chinamen were hurrying. The dirt and the glamour of the East come full upon one in these noisome, narrow streets, where the big lanterns swing and the Chinese children, playing in the entrances to subterranean dwellings, 
are like gaudy dragonflies lighting up the squalor. My heart began to beat with absurd apprehension as I fancied some accident separating me from the two in front, and I looked ahead at the sergeant's broad back. It was an easy, muscular, swinging, self-satisfied back, that, and even at Forbes' stooping shoulders, with a most comforting sense of man's place in nature, to do the rough work of women reporters' details. I said it to myself with a grin at the two unconscious backs ahead of me, but just the same I couldn't make believe to myself that I was at ease. The risk and the terror of Chinatown were upon me. In front of this red placarded wall that we were now passing, upon which the big black Chinese characters stood out boldly, Ah Lung, a member of the Chinese Educational Society, had been shot down night before last just at this time, even as he stood reading the notice of the reward for the arrest and conviction of Chinese murderers signed with his own name. And his two bodyguards stood behind him, the two without whom he had never dared show his head outside the door of his shop since a price had been put on his head. Where was the highbinder who had potted him from some nearby discreetly shuttered window? The police hadn't been able to get him, nor had they a trace of the murderer of Fong Gi, the Chinaman who had testified yesterday in court that five minutes after the shooting he saw old Chen Bak Yu, the head of the murderous Tong, open an underground door through which a fleeing hatchet man had passed. I was shivering within myself at the horror of it all as I tottered along my cue's end tucked into my pocket, my hands hidden in the long sleeves of my blouse. The silence of the crowd, the shuff shuffling of those slippered feet that hushed through the night, broken only now and then by the jangling and toning of a salutation as men passed each other, it got on my nerves. There seemed nothing positive, strong, outspoken in this yellow world of guile, of sardonic contempt for the white man's laws, of cruel confidence in the white man's corruption, of the power of Chinese gold and Chinese craft, and cynical, murderous, never-tiring Chinese patience. I caught myself straining my ears to hear the sound of Sergeant Wiss's big boot as it struck the pavement. But the stones of Chinatown are cushioned and reeking with the years of dirt, as its history in San Francisco reeks with the stain of crime, the guilt of bribery, and the failure of law. Then I found that I was looking into the faces of the Chinamen that passed me. This one might be he who shot Ah Lung, that one the fellow whose hatchet crushed through Fong Gi's skull. It won't do, it won't do, Rhoda, I cried angrily to myself. It's cowardly to be fanciful now. Everything in its place. Wait till you're writing your story, then you can spread yourself. But I drew a long breath of relief just the same when the sergeant stopped at a door, or rather a blind square of heavy wood, and rapped, not authoritatively as is the manner of the white policeman in Chinatown, but discreetly, significantly, with that contributory caution which is the taint the yellow Chinaman's yellow gold leaves on white fingers. "'Still game, Miss Massey?' Wiss whispered. I nodded. I couldn't speak. The door swung open from the inside, fully three inches thick it was, and without a knob, but on the inside there was a bolt which, when shot, might resist the blows of giants. The sergeant passed in, stepping down a couple of inches. The door itself was longer and broader than the doorway, and overclasped it as with a great seal of wood and iron. Forbes came next. I followed. My heart was beating violently now, but with excitement. The sick terror of imagining had passed. Across a narrow hall, then another door. In a moment it too swung open, thick, stout, like the first, and like the first, extending beyond the sill and beyond the sides like a trap door. Along a bare corridor and then the third door, like the others and behind and above it, where he could look out into the street from his post of observation, the lookout man on his perch, who must have pulled the cords that opened the three doors successively and admitted us at last. To what? Why, to a most orderly, sociable, quiet meeting of half a dozen Chinamen, sitting amiably chatting in sing-song Chinese, drinking tea and smoking their pipes. Fan-tan? 
Not a trace of it. A lottery or even a ticket? Tut, tut. A malicious libel upon simple conservative Chinese gentlemen, one of whom looked up blandly as we entered, from the farther end of the long, empty room, as though to inquire the meaning of our intrusion. Oh, you! Sergeant! Sergeant Wiss! It was a big, good-looking Chinaman of about thirty-five who spoke the sergeant's name, with an addition of S's that hissed sibilantly about our ears. But the soul of good nature was this Chinaman, and a facile excellence of English was his that showed the value of the mission schools. "'You come look for Fantan game, eh, sergeant?' he chuckled, clapping Wiss upon the back with an ease truly American and an innocent facetiousness that would have robbed defeat itself of its sting. "'Oh, I tell you, you bully officer, sergeant, no more gambling in Chinatown now. No hot air. I no give you hot air either. Who's your friend?' He nodded toward Forbes, but he let out a cadence roar in Chinese, at once guttural and nasal, at me. For excellent reasons I didn't answer, and Wiss's friend— Forbes had caught the message in my eye. Out. Let's get out, quick, it begged. And out we went, with a parting jolly from the loquacious Chinaman, an easy mixture of irony and appreciation of a joke. The life of the party he surely was. Not another man among them had vouchsafed even a grunt, and only one other had turned to look at us, an old Chinaman with a face of wrinkled evil a black eye as cold as fear, and a thin-lipped, sagging old mouth pulled down in a deformed sneer on the side from the pipe-stem that always rested there. "'Who is he? That one?' I asked the sergeant in a whisper as the last door shut behind us and we stood for a moment in a dark doorway. "'Chin back you.' "'The head of the Sui Sings,' I gasped. "'The highbinder's tongue?' He nodded. "'You evidently know your Chinatown, Miss Massey,' he said, watching me closely. "'And the other, the spokesman?' I asked. "'Oh, you don't know him? I thought everybody knew Yet. That's Yet. Yet Kim Guy, head man of the Weong Tong, the gambler's president, the—' "'The Chinaman who has a passion for mathematics, but who's a high roller in the Jerome Kirby of Chinatown?' He has a real legitimate wife, hasn't he, who's a little footwoman, and her jewelry boxes are piled so full of gold bracelets that she can't open them without their overflowing? That's yet all right. Good-looking fellow, isn't he, for a Chinaman? You ought to see him in his banqueting regalia, long about Chinese New Year. He looks the Mandarin, I tell you. But I'm sorry for the sake of your story, Miss Massey, that the thing turned out as it did. Still, we've rated him pretty steadily, and as I told McCabe when he first spoke of this Chinatown detail for you, there ain't anything much doing just now. We might go up to Pacific Avenue and try another place I know. No, no thank you, I said. I'm awfully obliged for all your trouble, but as you say... What? Have you had enough so soon? He laughed. Let's go up, Miss Massey, pleaded Forbes, interrupting. The boy was madly interested, but I shook my head. I'm sure it'd be only a waste of time. The coop will be waiting just around the corner here, so don't you bother, Sergeant. Mr. Forbes will get me in all right. I mustn't take any more of your time. I'm so much obliged to you. No, no, really, you needn't come. But your article, you haven't anything to write about, said the Sergeant, still watching me curiously. Oh, I'll have to find something, I assured him. It'll be descriptive, I suppose, which is a bore, but good night. Thank you. Yes, good night. He turned off and walked down the hill. Forbes and I went in the other direction. We didn't speak until we were safe in the coop. The boy was almost sulky at being denied further adventure. The glimpse I caught of his face as we passed a lamp post made me laugh outright. Did it get cross? I jeered just cause no one would play with it any more? Oh, he flushed boyishly and apologetically. It is so interesting. I don't see how you can resist seeing more. 
I can't, I said demurely. Then, then why didn't you let Wiss take us to the other place? I couldn't think of troubling the sergeant to that extent, I assured him politely. Imagine how much he must have to do with all those gambling games to suppress. What? Oh, nonsense. What is it? Tell me. This isn't the way uptown. What's that driver? Don't. I held his arm as he reached out to call to the driver. Why, he's going in the most roundabout way. He's actually turning back into Chinatown, the idiot. I'll bet he's drunk. Let... I'll bet he isn't, I giggled. I'll bet he knows that on the corner near the alley there are two policemen, not of the Chinatown squad, but from another beat entirely, in plain clothes. And there is also an old Chinawoman, a real one, but bought by the news, with dollars, and a passage on the next boat back to China already paid, for after tonight she'll live here in peril of her life every moment till the steamer sails. Bought partly, too, with good will to one Rhoda Massey, who, if you remember, was a country school ma'am for a year before she became the gifted journalist with whom you have the honor, Mr. Forbes, of taking this drive. But he wasn't listening. Oh, tell me, he began. Who she is? She's Gum Tai, mother of Wan Hoey, the clever, cute little Chinese boy who was in my class when I taught up in Placer County, where Hoey's father was doing a dribbling business in Placer mining on an old deserted claim. Gum Tai fell in love with me when I wouldn't let the little white urchin stone my Lord Wan Hoey, as she called him. Isn't it funny and delightful the way the Chinese women speak of their men children, Mr. Forbes? Miss Massey? We're merely going to go back over our tracks, Mr. Forbes, and... And make a raid without the sergeant on the other places? He shouted. Exactly, or very nearly. We're going to make a raid without the sergeant at the same place. But, but what? Hush, hush now. We're not going to give it away as he did, purposely. Remember how loud he spoke when we met him? The carriage stopped in the square again, and again I tottered out upon the cobblestones. And again we walked up the hill, Forbes and the two plain-clothes men in front, old gum tie and myself behind. The old woman hadn't spoken in answer to my greeting. She only looked at me for a second, a wry smile on her leathery old lips. Then her eyes fell, and with her back bowed and her hands in her wide sleeves, she wobbled on, and so did I. When we got to the great blind door, the three men had stopped at the corner. She stooped for a moment and filled her claw-like brown hands with pebbles. Or perhaps she already had them and stooped to pick up another. I don't know. I looked at her inquiringly, but she shook her head, and just then the door swung open. We passed in, she and I. She seemed to stumble a bit over the low step, and again at the second one. But by the time we had got to the third door, I didn't know what she did or what I myself was doing. For it swung open, and the room, the room was crowded almost to suffocation. That room where, not half an hour before, we had left only five or six Chinamen peaceably smoking. On the table was a heap of the big oval beans of Fantan, the rejected beans. The croupier was piling up the money before him, getting ready to pay out and haul in the bets. One of the counter's long, slender brown hands was just lifting up the bowl from the smaller white heap it had encircled, and chopstick in hand, he was deftly counting out the mass by fours. Yut! One, shouted a gambler. Gee. Two, wagered another. Say. Four. Sam. Three, yelled a triumphant chorus as the winner's quick eyes, mentally segregating the diminishing heap of beans, anticipated even the counter's swift stick, and prophesied that the division would have a remainder of three. Sam it was. Sam declared the croupier, and the clink of American money that went to pay Chinese gambling debts resounded through the smoke-blotted close room, and, and suddenly old gum tie caught my arm. I had actually forgotten, in my interest and excitement, why we two had entered first. There came a jarring whir and a slam, and quick as a flash, one after another, the three lookout doors went shut. No, not quite shut. 
for strangely enough in a place where Chinese guile foresaw all, and had provided for just such an emergency, something, some little trifling thing, lay in the way of every door's closing. Pebbles. A few pebbles had slipped from gum ties palsied hands as she stumbled over each threshold. And over those pebbles, which just prevented the mighty locks from catching, Forbes and the policeman rushed in. And there was pandemonium in that yellow gambling hell, and the Chinaman cursed and the money flew. I don't know what I did, but I saw Forbes, the greenest cub reporter we'd ever had on the news, dancing in ecstasy first on one leg and then on the other. And then the police whistles blew, and Sergeant Wiss, white as death, came dashing in with his men. His eye caught mine, and for a second I had an absurd sensation of being in peril, in pain, suffering, of feeling what a hypnotized subject must feel when it is suggested to him that he is being knocked down, beaten, trampled upon. When Forbes, waking with a start to memory of what his detail was, dragged me out and put me in the carriage, my teeth were chattering from sheer excitement. I couldn't speak a word and I didn't want to. I only wanted to keep my jaws still, and they were beyond my control. Inside, the tumult was still going on, though Wiss had placed nearly eighty men under arrest, and down the side hill toward the bay, I saw an old Chinese woman just disappearing down into a black-mouthed basement. It was gum tie. The quickness of her, the amazing celerity and cool-headed nerve of the old creature, who had been first to escape and was even now beyond pursuit. Graft in Chinatown? Well, I wonder. But I don't wonder at all that the Fantan game happened to be closed on our first visit in company with Wiss. I know what excellent use the Chinamen make of a telephone, and of a police officer who gives them a tip. Oh, if only Rhoda Massey might trace the graft a bit further. If she were only lucky enough and plucky enough to catch that same police officer in the act of accepting pay for police protection. I say... Wouldn't the town sit up and take notice? End of chapter 4